All right, in theory, we're live. But of course, would require some kind of external third party to explain. Brian, I got a question for you while we're like waiting for the stream to stabilize here. Uh, we're sure. talking about we're talking about this idea of falling into a black hole and that you're like seeing the universe accelerate around you. But if you're free falling into a black hole, does that make a difference? Then when whether you're like firing your thrusters and you're trying to hover outside the event horizon, it, of a black it does hole, make a difference. Or if you're yeah. orbiting around the black hole. So orbiting isn't the same as free falling into it. Right. Um, there's a pretty simple calculation to do if you're free falling into uh, a, bl a non rotating black hole. Do you still experience this any time dilation if you are free falling, or does the the free falling cancel well, that? Remember, out? time dilation is is non local, so you never experience your own time dilation. You think everything happens in real time. So mm -hmm. if someone is outside watching you fall towards a black hole, they will never see you reach the event horizon. Right, but from your perspective, if from you're... from your perspective, you cross the event horizon. No, I, in a absolutely. But, yeah, but you do watch the universe accelerate. So so if you look out, so if you were falling towards the black hole, but looking exactly opposite to the black hole, what you would see is is your um, horizon, basically the limit of where everything is black, would narrow and narrow. And it would get brighter and brighter right. because the time's right. compressing. So basically you get this this narrow little flash and then bloop, and then it's gone. Right. Yeah. When you cross the event horizon, the entire universe appears to fold on itself. Whoa. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, because that was sort of the additional change. Because I, I want to, you know, I, I have to be able to explain this easily, and so I'm, you know, I'm starting to gear up my analogies to try right. to accurately explain something that is. You know, you say it's pretty simple math. Horizon Brave in the chat is saying, uh, pretty sure it's like a blackboard's worth of math symbols. I see well, a, yeah. I see a kind of a, you know, but a it's, goodwill it's hunting similar. sort of situation. It's similar to when you approach the speed of light. So when you approach the speed of light, though, your field of view narrows yeah. Yeah. and gets really blue shifted. Yeah. So it's it's the same type of thing. Right. I mean, there's a little bit of difference, but it's basically the same type of thing where everything just kind of... Right. And same thing that you could hop in your spaceship, go close to the speed of light, travel 10 billion years, 10 billion light years in your lifetime. Right. And you would be seeing the, you would be seeing the future of the universe because you would be traveling through it. Okay. Right. And yeah. you could do like a close approach. If you did a close approach, you'd actually, you'd actually time dilate to the point that, you know, everything would go forward. So you could actually use that to go into the future, just yeah. go close to a black hole for a while and then zip out. Right. That's cool. All right, yeah, I'm gonna say hi to some people. Uh, hello to Andrew Planet, Ben Kalo, Bill Smith, Bob Muller, Brexit Denier, Brian Thomas, Christian Woodland, Corey S, David Dunn, David Fairweather, FFL, Frank Tippin, Harry Patrick, Horizon Brave, Ian Farkron, John Victor, Johnny J, Larry King, Lillian Brennan, Nancy Graziano, Rich Wilson, R uh, Ryan Schmitz, Susan Hunter, Tom Van Scotter, Trey Harmon, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey everybody, welcome to the pre-show of the. Uh, Weekly Space Ham. <laughs> Johnny J says, we're already off on a tangent. Hello, Wayne Francis and Andrew Planet. If I didn't see your name, David Dunn. Uh, that's cool. I think I, again, I need to sort of sort this out in layman's terms once and for all so that I can then just answer it because it comes up all the time. So, awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. Hal McKinney, hello. Jay Alex Anderson. Hal McKinney asks, is the reason a black hole is black simply because the stuff on the inside is moving faster than the speed of light? No. <gasps> it's funny. We call them black holes and they're neither black nor holes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's because the light can't, get, can't escape. All pathways lead to the singularity. Okay, we've reached five minute mark. So let's get started. Um, all right, put you all back in the boxes. And then back to me. Give my intro. All right, here we go. 
Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 14th, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about Pluto's snow-capped mountains, um, black holes making complex gravitational wave chirps as they merge, and alien planets that could have more diversity than Earth itself. Joining me this week on my screen, I've got Dr. Brian Coberlin. Brian. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. Glad to have you back. Um, we've got Beth Johnson. Beth. Hello. Yay. Um, and we've got uh, Moya McTeer. Moya. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. It's been like three Moyas in like a month, six weeks, yeah. maybe four weeks. I don't know. Weekly yeah. Space Hangout has been very Moya dense. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah, we get all. Yeah, all Moya all the time. We can handle it. No one, no one is objecting. No one is objecting. Yeah. Um, all right. So before we get into the guests, I just want to take a moment and have a huge thank you and an invitation to all of you to join the incredible community that surrounds this show, the Weekly Space Hangout Crew. They're the ones that are chatting in the chat. They are super active on the Discord server. They are, I guess maybe it's the CosmoQuest Discord server. Anyway, um, and they are really the executive producers of the show. Again, we are going to be uh, discussing some mind-bending, incredible topics today with some guests who are working at the forefront of this uh, type of astronomy, and I had nothing to do with it. That they were uh, they were invited to the show, and that was because uh, one of the executive producers for the Weekly Space Hangout crew. So if you want to help make the show that you watch, this is the way you do it. So go to wshcrew.space. They'll hook you up with all of the uh, credentials that you require, the business cards, and really the self-confidence to call all of these uh, astronomers and and, uh, and astronauts and invite them on the show. So, wshcrew.space. All right, let's get into our special guest, and we've got two guests this week. So, I'm going to start with, uh, we've got Jane Huang and uh, Jonathan Williams. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hello, everyone. How's it going? So, so wait, where are you? Uh, so, Jonathan, where are you located? I am in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Nice. Uh, on the island of Oahu. Oh, that's great. And I work at the University of Hawaii. Now, that's not your actual background. I can see you're, you know, you're, <laughs> you're getting absorbed into the background this, a little bit. So. Oh, okay. This this is Kaneohe, though. This is Kaneohe is a sort of hidden gem in Oahu. So it's uh, on the other side of the island. It's a very, very pretty place. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So that is what you would see if you knock down a couple of walls in your apartment. Yeah. 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 Well, awesome. Well, yeah. Well, and, and so, and so, and so what do you do? So I'm a professor at UH and um, I study planet formation like Jane. And um, so I, as a professor, you do a mixture of teaching and research and um so I've been uh, using Mauna Kea, uh, the radio telescopes in Mauna Kea, and uh, the, as we'll hear, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA, as um, there were prototypes of that on Mauna Kea, that's what got me started in this field. And so as tech, we follow the technology, we're driven by technology. And, and so um, we have been studying these protoplanetary disks from when they were little blobs to now when they have these gorgeous, uh, amazing, images and um, the technology allows us to do that. And then uh, we need the smart people like yeah. Jane, the young students to, to try and figure out what's going on. Great, we'll talk, we'll talk with Jane as well. So Jane, who are you? What do you do? Uh, so I am currently a postdoc at University of Michigan. The work that we're going to talk about today was something that I did as part of my PhD thesis at Harvard. Um, so like Jonathan, I work in the area of observational plant formation. A lot of what I do uses the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in um, Chile. And actually, Jonathan Williams was the advisor of my PhD advisor. And so let's, let's talk about the, the, uh, the specific research that you, that you guys were working on. There's like a great sort of uh, paper that we followed, and I'm sure one of the people on the team uh, reached out to you. Jane. Um, yeah, so we studied this really interesting object named RU loop. Uh, it's in the lupus star forming region. 
which is several hundred light years away from us. Um, so what Alma lets us do is look at the dust and gas emission in proplanetary disks. And actually this um, project was sort of inspired by the product of two different surveys. Uh, one was called the Lupus Survey and the other one was called uh, the Disk Substructures at High Angular Resolution Project or D-sharp uh, for short. Um, Jonathan, do you want to talk about the Lupus Survey for a little bit? Sure. So, um... The Lupus uh, star forming region is one of the closest uh, regions where stars and planets are forming. And, but it lies in the southern sky, so if you can't see it, um, but it barely comes above the horizon from Mauna Kea. So you need to go south, the other side of the Earth. And um, so it hadn't been well studied, at least at the wavelengths where we can look at disks. And, but Alma opened that up for us. And um, one of the first things we did was to basically, you know, like explorers, you just, you do a survey first. So we did a survey um, with um, Megan Ansdell, who's, who's on the page that we're gonna be talking about. And uh, we basically, I think, so we had 98 disks and um, we found, so we were studying the population of the disks, but there were a lot of bright ones that uh, needed more follow-up and that's where it came from. And so, and so, sorry, is it, you're dealing with a bunch of newly forming stars in like a, like a cluster? Yeah, it's a loose collection of stars. This is, this, so they're not tightly clustered together, but they have all formed at more or less the same time. And these are about 3 million years old, one to 3 million years old. Right, right. And so the, with Alma, you're doing sort of a large scale survey, like which, where did you do your survey first? And then how did you actually focus in? Because I mean, the, both pictures, the large scale pictures of the, of the, of the stars themselves, but also the incredible detail, like the blue one versus the red one, which I'm going to be, I'm showing to, to the audience, the two sort of scales of the, of the image and how you've got the sort of larger spiral image on the outside and then the actual core of the protoplanetary disk. So, so the, the big survey was, it was, it was first of all based on a space telescope survey, like Spitzer Space Telescope. So that kind of mapped the cloud and found there's a, um, a bunch of um, young stars that are detectable in the infrared emission. We, what we did is we then just quickly looked with Alma, each one nine, of these 98 stars, just one, two, three, just went through and it was a short map, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a detailed map. Um, so that, but with that, you could then figure out what are the characteristics, and in particular, what are the bright ones that we can then go in to study with much finer detail. So what you're looking at is a, is a very high resolution image of, a, of one of the stars that we, that we had first mapped at, at maybe 10 or 20 times that, that resolution, so much more blurry now. Uh, Jane, you know, when you think about the, like just the level of our understanding of, of like, again, I'm going to bring this picture up. Um, you know, we up until just a little while ago, we only knew about our own solar system. We're starting to discover these other planetary systems. We had theories about how the planets got where they are and the different kinds of terrestrial planets and, and gas giants and so on. What does a survey of this level start to tell us sort of at a, at a larger scale about what's happening, about how these formation processes are going on? Um, so I can answer that for the two different kinds of surveys that that are being done. So like Jonathan, Jonathan does these very big, Jonathan's collaborators do these very big population studies where you just get these very short observations of disks. And there you're learning about the masses and sizes of disks and, and what they're finding that seems to be a little odd is that the masses of these disks are smaller than what you would expect given how much mass we know is in planets. So that raises some questions about our understanding of the time scales of planet formation. And then with these very high resolution surveys um, that produced uh, the nicely ring yeah, uh, yeah. Is that we see in D sharp, we think that those rings come from uh, planet disk interactions. Uh, if that's true, that also implies that planets are forming in different locations from where we would expect them to be. They're, they're, they're forming very far out, which is weird from a planet formation theory perspective. Sorry, when you say far out, can you give me just sort of an example compared to, say, the, you know, the number of, number of astronomical units that we have here in the, in the solar system? 
Right. So Jupiter is at about five astronomical mm -hmm. units, Neptune at about 30. Um, and we're seeing these uh, gaps and rings anywhere from just a few AU out, which is, not, which is not unexpected. That's where Jupiter is, all the way out to maybe a couple hundred AU. And wow. that's a little bit more troubling from a planet. Right, planet nine level. Right, but planet nine is much smaller. It's well, what we think is would be smaller. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you've got a, a planet that is Jupiter mass, but it is forming that far out. And and are you seeing enough statistical commonality at this point to be able to say, okay, here's what solar systems tend to look like when they're forming? Actually, what's been really striking is the incredible diversity that we are seeing in these structures. You know, myself and other people working independently have tried to look for correlations with stellar properties. You know, in, with exoplanet studies, you see very neat correlations with um, st a stellar properties. So you would expect them to be them to be reflected in. Uh, the young planet population as well. And right now, there doesn't seem to be a lot of obvious relationships. Um, but one thing to note is that, uh, like Jonathan noted, uh, astronomers right now are pre preferentially looking at very bright sources. And that's simply because as, as an observer, you can get better quality right. data with the right. brighter sources right now. Um, so that may be introducing some bias in how we're learning about planet formation, that, that maybe the, these massive disks are all special, like they're, they're all massive for one special reason that wipes out the relationship between um, other stellar properties. And, and so you don't think that you're necessarily getting a good representative sample of the kinds of star forming, planet forming disks that you would see, like you're just seeing the big stars right now. Uh, well, the big disks. The big um, disks, right. Stars, the stars range in mass. Um, so we have reason to believe that our sample is biased. And as an observer, I say the solution to that is to get a lot more data. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because you've got this, like on the one hand, you've got all of the exoplanet researchers, uh, one of which is in our, one of our co-hosts. Um, and they are finding thousands and thousands of planets and and more and more the question of like is the solar system normal the answer is no no in fact we're seeing all kinds of, of variety but we're seeing you know when we look at the locations of jupiter and and saturn and we look at the locations of neptune and uranus and we know that there was this migration over the solar system's early history can you start to put these puzzle pieces together now where you can see these disks, see the locations of these gaps where you've got to assume planets are forming, and then you compare and contrast that with where the planets have been discovered. Can you start to see, okay, they form out here and then they migrate over there? Or do you think we're still too early in this process? Well, one challenge um, is that right now the techniques used to discover exoplanets by and large are favorable for planets that are very close mm -hmm. to stars. So there's bias there too. Um, and, and I think that's something that could be resolved in part by future uh, observatories uh, that are planned. So for example, something called the Roman Space Telescope, uh, formerly known as WFIRST, uh, should be able to detect to get statistics on the prevalence of uh, wide orbit giant planets through a technique called microlensing, um, which is mm -hmm. basically gravitational lensing on, on at very small levels. Um, and uh, so, so that'll be important answering the question of whether these apparently very wide orbit planets that, that we're inferring from these uh, disk observations are are present in old solar systems or whether they're migrating yeah. inward. It is uh, interesting to me just how little of the, like of the puzzle, when you think about like the pieces that can be seen, like we've got really good information about very massive planets around very um, lower mass stars that where they're perfectly aligned with us. And we've also got some great images of face on very young stars with their big planetary accretion disks around them, but you don't have all the rest of the pieces. Like you would love to see surveys of face on 
older stars with planets at various orbits around them. But that's really tricky to do, as you said, until you get to some of those newer newer observatories. So, so what do you think it will take to be able to take you to that next level? What kinds of instruments are you most excited about that are coming? I mean, almost a game changer. Um, is it some of the, you know, the ELT? Is it is it James Webb? Is it more coronagraphs? What what would you be looking to be able to do more research? Uh, so there are a couple of different things. Um, so Alma would very much like to do an upgrade. Like Alma is great, but we can always do better. We can try to add more antennas. We can try to extend the array so you can get even higher and higher resolution. And that will that would in principle let us maybe push down to resolutions where we're we have better overlap with exoplanet yeah, I mean, statistics. I also say, there's very few images of this quality that Jane has produced. There's maybe 30 or 40 disks yeah. compared to thousands of exoplanets. So we still have a lot of work to do with the current moment. I mean, when um, I saw these pictures, I mean, I I, I think the, the images of the protoplanetary disks around these stars, they were some of the most stunning images in astronomy that I think I had seen in in years. I you know I made a video about it. We freaked out about it on Universe Today. It's such a striking image that you were just staring down into a newly forming solar system, and you're seeing an actual picture of it. And yet everything else, you know, for the and, poor and, and transiting and the, exoplanet yeah, observers. That we're finding from it. So yeah, we are. All the questions you're asking are great questions, but we really have to start with this. So so there's a lot more we can do with the current technologies, more with new instruments, but. Uh, but, you know, these questions of why are they performing so far out? I think this picture shows maybe that there is some things we don't understand, like maybe large scale gravitational forces and strong, you know, th there's effects there that we hadn't really fully appreciated. So I would say there's still a lot to do. We haven't even fully understood the data we have at hand yet. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, sorry, okay, but you're right, you know, we want to upgrade ALMA, obviously. The ELTs are going to be very important. JWST will be important. And these will near term in the next few years. Right. Extended. And and as well, I mean, I think that the limitations with Alma, you're looking at objects that are cooler and you know, that are younger and cooler, that aren't putting out the same kind of energy necessarily as some of the more uh, evolved stars that have blown out their dusty disks. Like you're because you've got something that is very dusty, it's very it's perfect for Alma. So to, to be able to see the next time frame, I think would be very interesting as well to see what these evolve into. Is there sort of, you know, what do you think would be best to be able to take it to the next level? Next time scale, right? I think what you, these are called debris disks, these disks that are after the planets, have, after the primordial disk is gone and there's still rocks smashing into each other to build up the terrestrial uh, rocky type planets. They form a lot of debris that uh, we, we can detect, but it's really, really faint, hundreds of times fainter than what we're seeing in this image. So again, it's going to require a lot more. You know, the instruments are there to do some of this. Um, it just requires more dedicated time, like hundreds of hours to do in a single source or something like that. And that will happen. But right now, there's so many interesting things to do with Alma. We got to get yeah. Lots, we are still going to do the big, the, the kind of the initial reconnaissance, and um, but you know these debris disks, we will learn more about those as, as time goes on, and there'll be there'll be images of a spectacular this of debris disks, you know, which are ten million, one hundred million year old disks. Yeah, um, yeah. In the next five, six years. Maybe. Oh, that's incredible because that's that that's that next time frame. I mean, when we think about like a lot of right. the the pieces that came together to form the planets in the in the solar system, all of that bombardment, all of the like to be able to start to see into those next time frames, I think would be absolutely incredible. The other things worth thinking about is that um, oh, when we look at decade time scales, we may even be able to see time variations in some of these. We may see some of these structures yeah. may move. Um, and that, that's just maybe something Jane, something that Jane might think about, right? As she moves on in, in, from her young career to to uh, old Phoebe like me. She but I mean, these, see these structures move. I mean, Jane, you're seeing these these gaps in the you know you're seeing what must be planets carving out discs in these you know some in some cases perfectly face on. 
Is that the next step to actually see the little planets themselves? And I know it's been seen in some cases already, but. Yeah, so PDS-70 is the only system where planets have been detected directly in the gaps. I have some collaborators who are trying to use similar techniques to go after um, planets in other other uh, systems. There, there are a lot of really bright young astronomers working on upgrading technologies for direct imaging to search for emission from the planets. Um, and, and one hope is that while ALMA is not going to detect the planets directly, uh, people are hoping that it will be useful if you, if you stare at a disk for long enough for detecting something called a circumplanetary disk. And that's sort of analogous to protoplanetary disks, just like stars are surrounded by protoplanetary disks. We expect protoplanets to be surrounded by their own little disks that will also produce emission at radio wavelengths. Right. Maybe maybe you'll be able to detect the first exomoons before the, uh, you know, just through ALMA, which would be amazing. Yeah, there, there was a tentative detection uh, reported last year, and the team right now is, uh, I think, got deeper observations to to verify. I don't know what the status of that yeah. is, but it would be exciting to see the results of their new observations. That's really cool. Well, it's, uh, again, I, I highly recommend people, you know, we'll post some links in the show notes. And I think half of the fun of this discovery is really just seeing these pictures because you are just, you are staring into newly forming planetary uh, disks. It's, it's unbelievable work. And I cannot wait to see if people want to follow the work that you're doing, uh, Jane, uh, where should they go? Uh, well, I'm not terribly active on social media, so they can find out more about my work on my uh, University of Michigan website, which is a mouthful, sites.lsa.umich.edu slash J-N-H-U-A-N-G. Okay, awesome. And Jonathan? Yeah, well, same with me. I'm not a, I'm not a social media guy. That's good. But, that's, uh, that's for the best. Um, but you can, uh, if you Google, my name is very common, but Google Jonathan Williams Hawaii, and uh, you'll find my webpage. And Perfect. There's links back to uh, my research and so on. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Weekly Space Hangout uh, this week. And, and congratulations on the work so far. And I cannot, cannot wait to see what happens next. All right. It was great chatting with all right. you all. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Bye. All right. Let's move on to the, uh, the rest of the news. Everybody has been uh, so quiet this week. Um, Boya, you're on my screen. Tell yeah. us about... Uh, super habitable planets. <laughs> All right, yeah. So the, the headline of this article was, these alien planets may be more habitable for life than our own Earth. And I saw that, and I gave the biggest eye roll. Because this is this is pretty common, right? Where people claim that a planet is, is habitable or that it's more habitable than Earth, and it always ends up being not true. Uh, but but this paper was a, was a little bit different when I actually dug into it. Uh, so the uh, team of astronomers and astrobiologists, at least one of them, is at Washington State University. They searched through 4,500 4, Kepler objects of interest, or KOIs. And keep in mind that many of those aren't confirmed exoplanets yet, uh, but they are candidates. People think that they might have planets around them. Uh, and after when they were searching through these KOIs, they had a set of criteria that they were looking for that they think would make a planet more habitable than Earth. Um, and, and more habitable is based on uh, different simulations and climate models, and they're, they're looking for, for these criteria. So when they talk about more habitable than Earth, because I had, you know, when we posted a link to that, I got a bunch of snarky people going, like, whoa, maybe we should move there. Yeah. Not habitable for us. Right. Yeah. Death for yeah. us, but... So, so what is a definition of super habitable? So they are defining it in terms of biodiversity. Um, a planet that is defined as super habitable doesn't have to be habitable for us, and it doesn't have to be inhabited. So there doesn't have to be life on it. Uh, but they are running these simulations to try and figure out which planets could have the, the most biodiversity, the most um, different types of life forms. Right, right. And yeah. and so, I mean, I guess, I mean, when I think of an example, like you go to Costa Rica, there are more 
trees, different varieties yeah. of trees just in Costa Rica than there is in the rest of North America combined. Exactly. And so, so if you want a lot of different trees, that is a place that has a high level of biodiversity. And, you know, there's mm -hmm. upsides and downsides, I guess, to biodiversity, but mostly biodiversity is better than yeah. because then you don't get diseases taking out, wiping out an entire, you know, kind of creature, whatever. And so that's a way that you measure the overall health of an environment is, is there a lot of biodiversity? Um, yeah. And so what are some of the individual factors then which can contribute to this, this level of biodiversity? Yeah, and this is actually what drew me to this article because it it's world building essentially mm -hmm. is what they were doing. They're they're looking for criteria that would make a, a good world uh, for life. And so one of the criteria they have is that um, orange dwarfs or or K dwarfs are better for life uh, because they live for longer than sun like stars do. They live for twenty to seventy billion years, um, which means there's more time for life to evolve. And these types of stars, K type stars, are fifty percent more common than than the sun. Um, and then another criterion they had was that larger worlds would be better. Uh, we've known for a while that planets bigger than about one and a half times the radius of Earth are not likely, they're more likely to be gaseous than they are to be rocky. Right. So up to one and a half times the size of Earth is actually pretty great because um, more size usually means more mass. Mm -hmm. And so uh, more mass means that you have stronger a sh stronger gravity field. Uh, so you can hold on to your atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It means that your core, uh, if you have a molten core, can hold on to its heat longer. So you get um, a stronger magnetic field and it lasts longer. Right. And magnetic fields are really important for habitability. Right. And so we look at, say, Mars compared to the Earth. Mars, because it was, you know, has a fraction of the of the mass of the Earth, it cooled down Maybe it had a magnetosphere in the beginning, but now it's long gone. And so if you've got right. a star that is not going to be nasty in the beginning, like a red dwarf, mm -hmm. sorry, an M dwarf, um, but it's going to last for, say, 70 billion years, not 10, yeah. you've got, you want a planet that can go the distance as well. And that's mm -hmm. why you want that much more massive planet. Um, but if you – does the higher mass – make significantly more gravity? I mean, you're hopefully you're getting a bigger size as well. So it all sort of evens out, right? Yeah, it, it does kind of even out. It's it's a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. um, probably strong enough that if we went to that planet, we would feel it. We, it would suck. Yeah. Yeah. You, right. You would constantly feel like you would just run a marathon. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. But you wouldn't but it wouldn't necessarily stop. Like you would still have flying creatures. You would still have trees. You would still have oceans would be no problem. Yeah. Um, and most importantly, it's probably not that hard to escape the gravity well of the planet to have rockets and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I always pity those poor. I don't know if you've done yeah. any of this in your world building, those poor people that are in the heavier gravity fields and they just can yeah. never leave. Exactly. This is their prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay. So we've got, we've got the star, we've got the mass of the planet. What, what yeah. else is going to make for a good planet? So other things they want are warm planets because the tropics, the warmest places here on our world, uh, not the hottest places, but the, the most temperate regions have a lot of biodiversity. Uh, they want the land to be broken up. So we don't want any of those super continents like Pangaea because the land in the middle of the continent is so far away from the ocean that it's just too dry. Mm -hmm. So you don't end up with biodiversity there either. Uh, they also talked about wanting moons, um, wanting uh, more land, uh, mm -hmm. more shallow water, because there's more biodiversity in shallow waters than in deep oceans. So th those were a few of the things they wanted. After going through all of the KOIs, they found 24. Right. So from 4,500 to 24, uh, that did, none of them met all of the criteria, which is fine because most of these criteria can't actually be observed. Like we don't know if, how big the continents on, right. on exoplanets yeah. are. How deep the oceans are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they found 24 candidates, only two of which are actually confirmed exoplanets. All of them are more than 100 light years away, so they're too far for tests to observe, but they're probably within reach for James right. Webb. Um, and I think that's, that's the conclusion, which is that if you have 
4,500 exoplanets today. Mm -hmm. By the time James Webb flies, maybe you're going to have 6,000. Mm -hmm. By the time James Webb is finished operating, you may have in the tens of thousands. Where do you start? Because it can only observe at any great detail a fraction of those planets. Right, yeah. So it's best to focus on the planets that are most likely or that are best suited for life. So these 24 are the ones that we should focus on first, is, is what this paper is saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Hal McKinney is asking, how common are magnetic fields for planets? Oh, Do we know? That's a great question. Most, I mean, we see them in our solar system. Jupiter has a massive yes. magnetic field. Um, do all of the planets have at least some magnetic field? Well, Venus, I mean, Venus and Mars no longer have planetary wide magnetic fields, but they still have like little temporary surface level magnetic fields. Yeah. Uh, Ganymede has a magnetic field, has a planetary yeah. magnetic field. And then that's about it. So, yeah. so all really the only place that's habitable that has a magnetic field here is, is earth. Mm -hmm. Um, one, so, so, and we have no, currently we have no method of knowing the magnetic fields on, on exosolar planets. However, we talked about this, actually, I interviewed Seth Trostak last night. There's a plan to, to put a SETI telescope on the moon. NASA actually has one of its, um, uh, NIAC awards that are, that is looking at this, that you have a little Rover that will plop out, um, little radio telescopes along the surface of the moon in this great big pedal flower shape and once operational would be able to detect the interactions between solar flares and planetary magnetospheres essentially the 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 radio emissions that come from planets as their magnetospheres are protecting them from yeah. solar flares so perhaps within a decade or so well there could be a telescope on the moon capable of analyzing these planets and figuring out which ones have magnetospheres and which ones don't which is kind of amazing it's is that essentially just looking for aurora on yeah, other planets? Yeah, looking for auroras on other on exoplanets, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, awesome. So uh, did, this, did this give you some additional ideas for, for world, build, world building? Yeah, yeah uh, I think I'm definitely going to have to put an exolore episode together now set on one of these super habitable planets and see what a biologist thinks of it. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Awesome. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Brian, what have you got for us? So uh, this is looking at um, gravitational wave signals from merging black holes. So gravitational wave astronomy is still pretty young. We're still trying to figure out how to do it well. Um, we found about a, a dozen mergers of high mass objects, whether they're uh, stellar mass black holes or neutron stars. Um, and typically what we see from a signal is what they call a chirp, which is this, you know, as the, the two masses are in spiraling, you get this, if you converted it to sound, it would be this rising pitch. You get this oscillating, oscillating signal that then ends in a spike that then dies off. And so is that if you convert it to sound, it would just be whoop, and it would just, that chirp is what we hear. And, and it's very distinct from that very close rapidly rotating production of gravitational waves until the two objects merge into a single black hole. And it does a little bit of what they call a rain down where it oscillates and then settles to a stable black hole. And, and that's what we've observed with all of them. And, and part of this is that this is very much on, on the limit of noise detection. So you have to be able to detect very closely and actually model what the signal should look like within the noise. So you, you, you're really on that edge of sensitivity there. So, so this new study looked particularly at what they call asymmetric mergers. So this is where you've got one large mass object, like a large black hole and a much smaller black hole. And the reason those are important is because they're asymmetrical, the gravitational waves they produce are asymmetrical. And one of the things that can happen is when they merge and you get that chirp of gravitational waves, that can be off center. And so what would happen is that as they merge, the resulting black hole gets this gravitational wave kick. 
and gets pushed away from, hmm. from where the two black holes were. And this could actually explain why we see a few galaxies in which they don't have a supermassive black hole. So, so it could have been that they were a merged galaxy and when those two black holes merged, it kicked the black hole out of the galaxy, which is why, you know, the triangular galaxy, for example, doesn't have a supermassive black hole. Right, right. And so, and, and you don't need to like have any kind of complicated three body interaction. You could just have that kick from the two black holes coming together. Right, right. Because the gravitational waves are, are, are skewed towards yeah. the, the lower end. So they're off center. If they're about the same mass and they all just, the gravitational waves just kind of go off evenly. I actually have an example that you can do this with, which is that you take in a, you take a, t a tape measure, like a construction tape measure and you, you know, you pull the tape measure out and you put it on the ground and you let it bring it in. And as it's starting to come in, it starts to turn around and then it'll kick itself sideways when it finally comes in and you'll wreck your tape measure, but you got a chance yes. to, to experience it. But so you can see how, how two things coming together through that kind of orbit and rotation can actually kick it sideways, which is kind of amazing. Right. So, so what this particular study looked at it, it looked at these types of mergers and it found that you can actually get more than one chirp. So, so that basically we have the merger and then that little spike of really strong gravitational waves, depending on which direction the black hole gets kicked. If it gets kicked towards you, it, it basically creates one or more kind of multiple gravitational wave spikes. And so what you can get is you can get a chirp and then another chirp and maybe another chirp, huh. depending on how it goes. So you can get these, this kind of complex ripple pattern that's emitted after the whole thing has merged so that basically this thing is merged and it's it's kind of pushing through all of this gravitational noise to create multiple chirps and so is that what's going on is that it's actually like interfering with the gravitational waves that have already been emitted like is it I mean, I'm sort of like what, you know, when you think about the sources of the chirps, you can understand that for sure they, as these, as they're orbiting around one another and they're just about to collide, that's throwing out all kinds of gravitational waves. And when they do, you get this kick that throws out a gravitational wave, but what, what continue, and maybe as the things rattling back and forth or wobbling or whatever you get, but it sounds like it's a more right. significant, very specific f form of gravitational wave that's coming out of it. Right. I mean, the, the gravitational waves are moving at the speed of light, so they're moving faster than the black hole. But the, but the, as the black hole is merging, it's sloshing. And so, so you not only do you get this, this kind of kick motion, but you're also going to get a, a ring down that isn't symmetrical. Hmm. And, and it's that asymmet asymmetry that really causes the gravitational waves. So like if a black hole was perfectly spherical, and not rotating and just oscillating like this, it wouldn't produce any gravitational waves. Right. And so it's that asymmetry that produces this, this turbulent region of gravitational waves that we see as multiple chirps. Will any of this give us any insights to what's going on within the event horizon? So that's, that's the real key because when you get these multiple chirps and right now, they're the, the, the higher level chirps, we might be able to see a second one if, if it happens to be coming directly towards us. But the higher level chirps are just too faint for us to observe with modern observatories. But as we get something like LISA, so you get a space-based gravitational wave detector, you will be able to see these things. And, and it will help us understand the event horizon. So one of the real fundamental theories of black holes is something called the no-hair theorem. And the idea of that is that no matter what you squeeze into a black hole, no matter how you squeeze it into a black hole, when it settles down, it has a, the event horizon has a shape that's only dependent upon mass, rotation, and electric charge. And that's it. There's only three numbers that determine the shape of an event horizon. So, so we think that's true. General relativity says that that is true. But alternatives to general relativity say it might not be true. Right. And, and, and because and the, the way those multiple chirps happen could tell us whether or not the no hell theorem is true. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think I can already predict the, 
the story that we'll be writing on Universe Today, something with the words Einstein right and again in the <laughs> in the title. But at some point he's got he's got to be wrong because yes. we you can't make quantum mechanics and general relativity come together inside the event horizon. So right. I mean, at some point somebody's got to have an extension to general relativity that that allows you to bridge that gap. Right. I mean it, basically you've got kind of two outcomes. As you keep pushing this, it's either Einstein finally proven wrong or quantum theory fundamentally wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Something's got to give and so Something's got to give. Right. Yeah. And so someone's got to be able to make some kind of observation right in at the very moment. And it's just so incredible. Even when you think about the, the images that were taken with the Event Horizon Telescope, and I think you had done the story for us as well, just that that he was proven 500 times righter than before. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, so he's, he's, even, he's so right, he's beyond right. He's beyond right, super right, which just means that it it's just, and, and, the, and yet quantum mechanics is the theory that has, that has the, like is the, like the most accurately predicted um, scientific theory that it that has ever been seen. You know that you can predict that again to decimal places that you run out of decimal places to be able to to make those predictions. Yes. So something's got to give. And I mean, it's this is classic fiddler on the roof quantum mechanics. You go, you have a point. General <laughs> relativity. You also have a point. They can't both have a point. You have a point as well. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, Beth, what have you got for us? Okay. So uh, my story is on everyone's favorite not planet, Pluto. Um, amazingly, the New Horizons flyby, which only lasted a few minutes, has provided us with enough data to analyze for years so far. Well, partly because and... it's all coming back so slowly. <laughs> yeah, right? that, that too. Um, so the latest paper to come out covers the ice on the mountains, um, which looks like ice on Earth mountains. And so everybody went, OK, well, let's kind of look at this. And then as they analyzed it, they realized that um, in particular, looking at this one mountain range called, and I'm going to probably butcher this, but Pigatheta Montes, um, they found that the concentrations, um, the ice itself is, of course, methane ice. It's not water ice. And the concentrations of the methane ice were highest at the higher elevations on these mountains. And then the concentrations were decreasing downslope um, to the surface. So they've left behind these really bright deposits and, and they've done all this, you know, simulations to kind of figure out how they could have gotten there. So the big deal on this is that on Earth, our atmospheric temperatures decrease in general as we go up um, through the atmosphere. So as we get higher up, it gets colder. And the colder air cools off, expands as it keeps moving upward. And so we that helps kind of keep the surface a little bit cool too. And then when we get some humid winds that come towards the mountains on Earth, the water vapor gets cooled, it condenses, and we get snow. Right. Which Having grown up in Colorado, I know way too much about. On um, Pluto, it doesn't work like this, which is why this whole thing has become a little weird. So there's in, no oceans. There's there's no oceans, but there's there's the atmosphere is really thin. Right. So um, for Pluto, the process kind of goes in the opposite direction. So the atmosphere actually warms up as your altitude increases because the methane gas in the atmosphere absorbs the solar radiation huh. and is actually concentrated at higher elevations. So because the atmosphere isn't very thick, it doesn't actually have an impact on the surface temperatures, which stay cold. So Pluto's wind just kind of goes down the mountain slopes and then the like methane ice is at the top and then it's it sort of sits up there, but it doesn't make it all the way down. So as you get down, there's less and less methane ice and it's just, um, I think at that point it becomes more water ice. So um, they used some computer modeling to kind of figure this out. And, and that's when they found that it just, it has more gaseous methane at these warmer, higher altitudes. And then it's really, you know, hard for that to condense down further. So it, um, it condenses up at the top. <laughs> that's really, that's really interesting. And yet looks again, looks like snow capped mountains. 
it looks like snow capped mountains and they find they found that um, it also works on Pluto's crater rims too. So um, there's this area called Tartarus Dorsa and they've got these really cool um, bladed terrain around the rim and it looks like those are methane ice caps. Wow. <laughs> so that's what's happening there too. So it's it's kind of cool and uh, it's a really neat little process. Um, definitely kind of turns literally sort of turns our process upside down right right um and moya put her hand up <laughs> i didn't know i've never asked a question before <laughs> in here um i didn't know the protocol You're lucky i even noticed no no, no you just <laughs> yeah. you got to jump in there and just start okay. asking and then i'll shut up that's how got this it. works do we know anything about the texture of methane ice like what would it be like to ski down one of these slopes <laughs> You know, I'm I'm not personally sure, but from the comments about the bladed terrain, I'm guessing skiing might not go so well for you. So it sounds like it's it's a, a sharper, more jagged ice structure to it, um, which would make sense because you're talking methane is CH4, so um, probably not as nice and angly as water that all kind of fits together so when you start to get that ch4 going it's probably a little bit more bumpy well you have those those st structures and i'm forgetting the name of them but they're like spikes of of ice that you get in certain conditions on earth and they think that in fact we're seeing those on we'll be seeing those on europa and enceladus so i wonder if it's the same situation that you've got you know you don't have snow falling sprinkling down in the same kind of way you've got perhaps ice forming out of the atmosphere as it's moving up so it'd be interesting to see what somebody needs to send a lander Probably. so many landers i i want so many i want all the landers and i want an orbiter or two yeah there you go zap zap fan zap fan just put it in the chat it's penitente those are the those so penitente are these jagged um I'll, and I'll, I'll i'll show a picture of them in the in so people can see what we're talking about um yeah, the, every time I see any of these kinds of discoveries, I'm just like, well, that's great. And too bad we won't be able to go back and take a look at it for 20 years. Right. I mean, because even if we got something off the ground tomorrow, we'd still have to wait a long time for it to get there. And... Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to land on Pluto because you have to go so fast to get there in any reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Here, I'll show you what these things look like. I don't know if you've if you've seen them. Um Hold on here. I'm apparently wearing Pluto now. Yeah, you are. You can't see. Yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to tell you, but you you are uh, ghostly oh, yeah. Pluto. Um, now my my the sun is coming directly in through my window now, which has completely destroyed my green screen yeah. effect. So yeah. now now I am the green screen. So that's great. <laughs> so you see, so this these are penitente, and these are on Earth. These are in Argentina, but this is what they think it looks like on Europa and Enceladus. Fraser, I've heard of these. Yeah. And and they do, at least here on Earth, they do this really cool thing where like sunlight bounces between them. So you actually get pretty warm regions uh in between all of these these ice spikes. Um Yeah. I don't I that probably doesn't happen on Pluto when, when sunlight is not Well, I but I mean the th I mean again, we are so far out over our skis, as it were. Um, but you know what we're i mean the thing that's just so amazing about these worlds is just how like titan for example that the that the the sand is made of water and the mountains are made of water but the lakes are made of methane and it rains methane and everything is shifted and then you go to pluto and the and the the mountains are made of of water ice and they're thousands of meters high and the glaciers are ammonia and and methane ices that shift around on the surface so um it's you know it's it's pretty fascinating to see very familiar structures show up again and again on on and, other worlds in the solar system and so I, I looked it up and those are the penitentes are what's at uh tartarus dorsa Tart okay yeah, great so so it is the same structure yeah so do not do not do take not your skis ski down, those. Ski down that yeah, yeah. Unless you want to just be sliced up into, you know, pieces on on Pluto, um, but we will talk to Alan Stern about it when when he's next on the show, which I think is coming up in a couple of weeks. So I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about it. Um, 
All right, Beth, you're on my screen. So why don't you let people know what uh, what you're working on and where people can find out more about you? So right now, uh, I'm working with CosmoQuest on planning our annual Hangoutathon, Yay. which is our big 36-hour fundraiser. Fraser, I'm sure you, you're all going to hear I'm more sure. about this as we get closer, <laughs> but yeah. So um, we're just kind of, we're finishing up the planning of all of that because uh, as we are CosmoQuest, we will probably be planning until the night before. So that's it's just, it's just how we roll. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's what, like the 20... Twenty fifth and twenty sixth of this yeah, month. So that's so still, it's, that's, oh, ten, that's week like and a half days away. away. No yeah, big yeah, deal. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got time. Right. Okay. And if, if someone was to follow you on Twitter, uh, I am at Planetary Pan, pretty much on all the things. So awesome. That's where you can find me. Right on. All right, Moya. If people want to find out more, where should they go? Uh, you can go to Twitter or Instagram. My handle is Go Astro Mo, and uh, I. I'm trying to focus more on the PhD side of things these days. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been doing more research. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. When, when, when do you defend? Um, probably in, in March or April at this point, the pandemic pushed me back. Right. Uh, right. But yeah. March or April. Right. So probably in March or April, but also time has no meaning. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. I'll let you know when I'm a doctor. Oh, sounds good. So, so like March 365th is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> right. We will look forward to calling you doctor. Yeah. January. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I, I've mentioned this several times before. This show is a doctor factory. So uh, we've produced so many doctors, so it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. I can't fail. You cannot, you literally can't fail. This is training. You just didn't even know. You're, this is just like defending your thesis right now. Um, Brian, uh, what are you working on and uh, where can people find out more? Uh, right now, I'm mostly working on stuff for NRAO for the next few days. And then I'll probably write another article for Universe today. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Coberline. You can find my website is briancoberline.com. Basically, if you can spell my name correctly, you can find me. Awesome. Um, all right. So... Uh, tomorrow morning, I, I, I've warned everybody that I do random interviews now on my YouTube channel just to, for whatever works for the guests because I was having a hard time shoehorning them into my time of day. So I let them choose. So tomorrow at 8.30 Pacific time, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Dirk Schultz Makuch, who is the researcher behind the super habitable planets. So we will get... All of the parts where we weren't sure about the answer to, I'll dig into all of those and I'll bring this all back to uh, a report to, to Moya afterwards. Um, so that'll be tomorrow at, uh, at 8.30. So come and join me for that on my channel. It's in my calendar. You should be able to find it, but I know it's random and you, you're going to forget, but you can watch it afterwards. It'll be in the podcast, so, so it should be a good time. All right, I'm going to put everybody on the screen. There we all are. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week on the Weekly Space Hangout. We really appreciate your support and just hanging around with us. Thanks to all the people who are asking all the great questions. Again, I, I am sorry I can't get to any of them, most of them, but it's great to see them in the in the chat. Thank you to uh, Nancy Graziano and all of the mods working hard. Thanks to my co-hosts and our special guests this week. And we will see uh, – actually, you know what? You won't see me next week or any of us next week because uh, I'm not going to be hosting this week. That will be Pamela. So Pamela will host next week, and there will be a different crew with her. So uh, see you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.